Hello and welcome back one last time. This is the very last lecture in the Principles of Microeconomics series, which means that I have but one last chance to tell you to buy my book, A Step-by-Step -step Guide to the Principles of Microeconomics. If you are not already in my class, then you don't even know how great it is and you should check it out and it's very good and you should try it. All right, so I can think of no better way to go out than to talk about wage differentials. I hope that you're excited. I know that I am. Uh, so first, I want to talk to you about a game that we're not actually going to be able to play through the camera, but I want you to think about it nonetheless. So I want you to imagine uh, that you are an employer, okay? Uh, and you are trying to figure out who to employ, all right? Uh, and you are trying to hire the person who, and I'm going I'm to hand out cards to all the employers that's going to, or the, all the employees that's going to tell them how good of a worker they are, right? And the higher a number they get, the better a worker they are. Uh, the more human capital they're going to have, the more skill they're going to have, the more profit they're going to make for you, the employer, all right? So you want to hire the best people, uh, but you also want to do it at the lowest wage. So you want, you don't want, certainly don't want to pay anybody uh, for more than they're going to provide for you. Now I'm going to hand out these cards, and the backs of the cards have two different colors. One is red, and one is blue. And you happen to know that the cards that I have handed out uh, have different numbers on them, right? So uh, the red cards go from 2 to 6, and the blue cards go from 4 to 8. All right. So I want you to think, and maybe even pause the video and think about it for a second. Uh, if someone came up to you, and they had a red-backed card, and, and they're not allowed to show you the number that they have, they're just going to show you the red back of the card. Uh, how much would you be willing to hire them for? What, what wage would you offer them? Because right? you want to offer them a wage that will get them to work for you. Uh, you know, you're competing against all the other employers who are trying to hire them at the same time. But also, you don't want to pay them more than they're going to produce for you. right? If you offer them a wage of 7 and you know, then you reveal the card and it's a 6, you just lost money. Or if you offer them a wage of a four and it turns out that they have a three, again, you just lost money. So what's the wage that you would offer a person with a red-backed card? Okay, well, let's think about an alternate situation. Let's say that you are approached by an employee, a potential employee, who has a blue-backed card. And well, what wage are you going to offer to them? Right? So again, you don't want to hire them for more than the number on their card, uh, but you're also trying to compete against the other employers. Right? So you got to think about how much you're willing to pay and, and, and how much you're, you're willing to pay based on the back of the card that you can see, right? Because the different backed cards correspond to different numbers on the front. So just think about what that wage is that you would offer. Keep that in the back of your head and then we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So last time what we talked about uh, was the market for labor in general and we also talked about the concept of wage differentials. Right, wage differentials simply being the fact that different people get paid different wages. Okay, uh, And we gave one explanation for why this could be. We talked about human capital. Human capital is basically the set of skills that you have, either general human capital, which is just sort of the general pool of skills that you have, things like reading and writing and you know, knowing not to yell at your boss and all that good stuff. And specific human capital are skills that are specific to the kind of job that you're actually going to do. Uh, and so, you know, you might, uh, if you're a really good wood craftsman, you might know how to build a chair. And that would be a piece of specific human capital that's very helpful in the chair building business, uh, but not so helpful uh, if you are a dog walker. Okay, so uh, that is one explanation for why different people get paid different amounts. Either you're just a more skilled worker, right? Uh, we talked about how labor demand is based on setting the wage equal to the price times the marginal product of labor. Simply put, if you are a person with high amounts of human capital, your marginal product of labor is very high, right? Because you are simply, if they hire you, you have a lot of skill. You're going to produce a lot of stuff for them. You're going to make them a lot of money. Uh, and so your marginal product of labor is high. So then according to the labor demand curve, people are going to be willing to pay you more. People are going to be willing to pay you more because you produce more for them. Whether that's general human capital or specific human capital. If you're really great at fixing cars, then a car mechanic shop should be willing to pay you a high wage because you're going to do a whole lot for them. However, this is not going to be the entire story of wage differentials either. Uh, and, you know, you can probably guess this by the fact that it, it's a very rosy picture that it paints, right? Everyone gets paid exactly what they're worth, uh, which may or may not fit with what your view of the world uh, actually looks like. Um, so we're leaving something out. And, and in fact, there are going to be a number of things that affect the wage that you are paid 
without affecting the marginal productivity of labor, right? Differences between people in the marginal productivity of labor is sort of a fair reason to pay them differently. You know, you, somebody produces more for you, you pay them more. You got to pay them more because otherwise somebody's going to compete and, buy, and offer to pay them more. And, you know, they're going to they're going to work for them instead of you. So, you know, that, that seems pretty fair. Uh, there are a lot of other reasons, however, why different people get paid different wages that have nothing to do with differences in their productivity. That is to say, nothing to do with differences in human capital. And today we're going to talk about some of those. Now, there are actually a lot of reasons why wages might differ other than for differences in marginal productivity of labor. Uh, and there are a lot of them listed here. If you're interested, uh, go Google some. We're not going to go into every single one of them today. That would simply be too much. Uh, but, you know, lots of cool ones, right? Lots of Nobel Prize winning ideas here, efficiency wages, uh, you know, job search theory, market concentration. We, you know, we certainly never really even talked about something called monopsony, uh, which is like monopoly, but it's for buyers and rather uh, a single source of buyers rather than a single source of sellers, which of course gives the buyer, the employer, market power in that market so they can pay a little bit lower than people are worth. But we're not going to get into that today. Today we're going to focus on three particular explanations for wage differentials. Uh, those explanations are, number one, compensating differentials, uh, number two, labor unions, and number three, discrimination. Okay, so we're going to talk about each of these three in turn. So uh, let's start with the first one. Let's start with compensating differentials. So a compensating differential occurs when one job is more or less enjoyable to work at than another. Basically, uh, you want to work at this job rather than this other job, and that's going to have an effect on the wage that you get paid. Uh, and uh, what a compensating differential is, is it's basically you have to compensate somebody. You have to pay somebody to make up for the fact that they're working at your crappy job that they don't want to work at. Okay, that's the idea here. So imagine that you have two different jobs. You have job A and you have job B, and they require the exact same set of skills, right? And they're attracting the exact same, you know, pe the people with the exact same level of human capital. So there's no difference in the productivity here. But job A is, you know, uh, a lot more fun to work at. People, more people want to work at it for whatever reason. Nobody wants to work at job B. And there are lots of reasons why that could be. Everyone wants to be at A, nobody wants to be at B. So what that tells you is that if, if job B wants to hire people, they're going to have to pay them more, right? Because well, imagine why that is. Imagine that you are an employee and you're trying to get a job. You look at job A, you look at job B, and you think, hey, I have the skills to do either of those jobs. I could easily do either of those jobs. So which one are you going to choose to work at? Well, obviously, you're going to work at, to choose at job A, unless job B pays you more. In which case, you might be willing to go with job B. You think, well, you know, it's not as good of a job. Uh, maybe the hours are more rigid. Maybe the boss is going to yell at me. Uh, maybe it's just not a nice looking building to work in, but they're going to pay me more. And that'll make up for the fact that the job is not as good. So I'll be willing to work from that's the compensating differential. You're compensating me for the fact that I don't actually want to work at this job, right? That's the idea here. One form that this takes is the risk of the job, the riskiness of the job. Some jobs are simply more risky than others. You're more likely to simply die on the job uh, because that's where you're working, right? So taxi cab drivers, police officers, soldiers, security guards, these are all jobs uh, where there is a higher than average risk that you will get injured or killed on the job. Uh, so that would be a good reason to not work at these jobs, right? And if you took two different jobs, which took the exact same level of skill, but one of them is riskier, well, how are you ever going to get people to work at that job unless you pay them more to compensate for the fact that it's riskier? And we, in fact, do see this in the data. If you, if you look at employment data and you compare jobs that take a very similar level of skill, uh, but one of them is riskier, that risky job does tend to get paid more, which is exactly what you'd expect from the theory of compensating differentials, which says that whichever job people don't want to work at, uh, it's going to pay more than a job that takes the same level of skill, but people do want to work at. Uh, so the actual way this shakes out is that if people who work in a job with a 1% higher risk of death are compensated about $100,000 more over the course of their working life. Right? So that sort of works out. Which, as an interesting aside, you can actually sort of take that figure and calculate out how much people value their own lives in dollar terms, which is a very economics style thing to do. Uh, and there are lots of different ways to calculate this number uh, and all the different ways you do it, you tend to come out with a similar figure of about seven to $12 million. That is people value their own lives at about seven to $12 million, which is uh, either high or low, depending on what you think. I'm not actually sure. Anyway, 
So uh, we see that this wage differential, this compensating differential pops up for any reason that you might want to work, especially at one job or especially not work at another job. Uh, this could also be uh, in the form of how sort of noble or idealized that sort of job is. Uh, so for example, uh, if you are, or, or, or enjoyment level, how much you enjoy it. So you might notice, for example, if you're a programmer type, that programmers tend to get paid a lot less at video game companies than they get paid at other types of programming companies. Why is this? Well, a lot of programmers really like video games and they want to work for a video game company. So if you're a video game company, you think, well, I can, I can, afford, I can pay them a little bit less than everybody else does because they want to work for me anyway. Okay. Similarly, uh, if you're talking about artists, uh, artists tend to prefer to work on their own projects rather than work for you know, some company uh, doing, working on their projects. And so you know, those companies have to pay them more than they could get working for themselves in order to get them to be employed. Right? Typically an independent artist is going to make a little bit less money than they would if they you know, sort of sold out and went to work for a large corporation making art for them. This is all compensating differentials. Uh, you know, it, it could also be how distasteful the job is. If it's a job where everyone's going to hate you every time you go to a party and you say that that's what you do, you're going to have to pay people more in, in order to make up for that. Uh, all that sort of stuff. So let's, let's, let's put this into a little bit of a test. So I want you to think. I want you to imagine, I want you to close your eyes and imagine your dream job, okay? Whatever the job is that you would choose to do, if you could do any job in the world and, and earnings were no, it doesn't matter what it pays, what's the job that you want to spend your life doing? Okay, think of that for a second. Okay, now, I want you to think, okay, how much does that job actually tend to pay? So I want you to write that number down. So maybe, uh, maybe all your life you you really wanted to be a dog walker. That has been your uh, your passion. Whether or not it's actually in your plans, that's the job that you would choose to do. And what do dog walkers get paid? Well, not a whole lot. Uh, maybe they get paid twenty five thousand dollars a year, something like that. Okay, so you got twenty five thousand dollars a year in mind if you indeed did choose dog walker. Now, step number two. I want you to imagine an alternate job. Uh, that you'd be willing to do, you know, that, you're, that you'd be interested in, but it, it doesn't pay as much. Or sorry, it, you don't enjoy it as much. Uh, so maybe instead of dog walker, uh, you're thinking about something else. Like maybe you're going to be an accountant at a dog walking firm. Okay, well maybe, you know, it gives you some of the things that you wanted, uh, but not all of them. And so you're not doing something you'd like quite as much. Uh, so I want you to think, okay, let's say that those are the only two jobs in the world. Dog walker or accountant at a dog walking firm. How much more money would they need to pay you to choose the accountant job over the dog walking job? Well, we determined that the dog walking job paid $25,000. If you would turn down the accountant job at higher and higher wages until it got to, let's say, $50,000, okay? Let's say at $50,000, you're like, fine, fine, that's too much money to turn down. I'll take the accountant job. Well, that means that your compensating differential for working for the accountant job was $25,000, right? You had to get paid an additional $25,000 to be willing to take the job that you didn't want to do, right? So that is your compensating differential. That's the whole idea. You have to pay more to get people to do jobs that they don't want to do. All right. So that's compensating differentials. That's the first of our explanations for the concept of wage, for, of, uh, wage differentials. Number two, labor unions. So labor unions are another way in which wages can differ uh, that has nothing to do with the actual productivity of the workers themselves. So in the case of compensating differentials, the differences in wages we were explaining was differences between different occupations or maybe between different firms, right? Some occupations people really want to do, other ones people don't. The ones people don't want to do get paid more. Or maybe some places are really great places to work, some places are really awful. The awful places are going to have to pay more to make up for it. Unions is going to be about uh, people getting paid differently within the same type of occupation, but across different firms. Some firms are going to be unionized and some firms are not. The unionized firms are going to be end up paying more, right? And the reason for this is that, uh, well, if you're not familiar with the concept of a labor union in general, what it is, uh, that the employee, employees of a particular firm uh, will band together and they will, uh, uh, they will work together uh, to negotiate with the firm for higher wages or better benefits and all that sort of thing. Uh, now, this is basically the exact same thing as what we talked about earlier uh, with monopolies, right? A monopoly uh, or an oligopoly is when the producers in a market get together uh, and they decide to work together and they keep the prices high. 
Similar idea with the labor union. The producers of labor, right, the employees, are then banding together uh, and they are, you know, negotiating with each other. They're, they're colluding together in order to keep prices high. Right? That's the whole idea of a labor union. Now, whether that price is in the form of an actual increase in the wage uh, or better health benefits or whatever it is, uh, that's the whole point. And so the reason why labor unions tend to get paid more is because of the, everything we talked about before with pricing power. See, I told you that all that stuff from before was going to come back. Here we're talking about pricing power. So when we have a labor union, that market is no longer competitive. Uh, so we get all the things that go along with, uh, with pricing power, right? We see higher wages, we see lower quantity, in this case, lower, uh, lower labor employment. Um, uh, and uh, so that's the downside, of course. We have inefficiency, we have unemployment, uh, but it also means that those workers do indeed get higher wages. And so if you're comparing two different firms, one of which has a labor union and the other one does not, you would expect that the people with the labor union are getting paid higher wages than the people without one. Uh, even if the marginal productivity of labor, even if the human capital is exactly the same between the two of them. Uh, so this is basically a second situation in which we have uh, uh, different people getting paid different wages. There's a wage differential that has nothing to do with human capital. Okay. Uh, let's take an example of this. Let's talk about, uh, well, Cal State Fullerton. Uh, if, which if you're not in my class, that is the uh, university that I am at. Uh, so the uh, CSU uh, faculty union, the CFA, not too long ago uh, had a strike uh, and they stroke, they, uh, the labor union has struck uh, in order to try to get a wage increase. And in fact, we did get a wage increase. Uh, so we can think about, well, what are the pros or what are the cons of having this labor union action at the CSU? Well, I can tell you, I certainly appreciate my higher wages as a result. Uh, but, you know, also we can think about, well, there's probably going to be a lower quantity of labor hired, right? It's probably that the CSU is not hiring as many people as they would uh, if wages were lower and the union was not there, right? And that's a trade-off that you have to think about. Well, how do we value the wages of the people who are employed against the employment probability of the people who are not, right? There's always a trade-off with pretty much everything, right? Okay, so... We've got two in the can now. Well, we've got three if you count human capital. We have human capital as an explanation for wage differentials. Uh, we have compensating differentials, which is, explains why you get paid more at a job that you don't want to work at. We have labor unions, which is going to explain why a unionized workforce is going to get paid more than a non-unionized workforce. Uh, now let's move on to something a little bit less fun. Let's talk about discrimination. Uh, so there are... Uh, uh, what we're talking about here is personal discrimination, uh, where someone is going to receive a different wage because of who they are in some way that is unrelated to their skill, right? And there are many different kinds of this. You've probably, you know, heard about this sort of thing, right? People, there's wage discrimination on lines of race, gender, uh, religion, sexuality, weight, age, etc. The list goes on and on, okay? Uh, and uh, the key here, right, is that we're talking about comparing people who are the exact same skill level, but they're getting paid differently because of who they are. So if we sort of look at the types, the sources of difference we've looked at before, right? Compensating differentials is differences between different occupations or different firms. Labor unions is differences between different firms. Uh, discrimination is differences between people, often even at the exact same job in the exact same firm. Okay. Now there are actually two different kinds of discrimination as economists see it. Uh, the first is called taste-based discrimination. Uh, and this is you know, sort of, you think about somebody not liking a particular group of people and not being willing to employ them or only being willing to employ them if they're coming cheap, all right? That's one form of discrimination. The other is called statistical discrimination. Uh, and you can sort of vaguely think about this if you're familiar with the term systemic discrimination. It's kind of similar. It's not quite the same. Uh, and the basic idea with statistical discrimination is it's more about stereotypes, right? You, you are only willing to, you're, you're not willing to pay people quite as much because you assume that they are not as good as others, okay? So uh, let's talk a little bit more about taste-based discrimination. Uh, now, this is discrimination that comes from a personal preference against a group of people, right? A taste against a group of people, almost like you have a taste against a particular flavor of ice cream, right? Although a little bit more serious as a topic. This can come from any number of different sources, right? It could come from the employer having a particular taste against group people. For, so, for, so for example, Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company was not a fan of Jews and was not willing to hire uh, Jews. Uh, and you know, so that, that would be a form of taste-based discrimination. It could be discrimination from the other employees. Uh, so for example, a lot of labor unions uh, would threaten to strike if the company they were working for ever uh, offered to hire, ever tried, tried to start hiring black people. 
so there is a form of discrimination that comes from other employees saying, we don't want you to hire uh, this type of people. We don't like them. Uh, and lastly, the discrimination could come from the consumer themselves, right? The consumer could prefer that the employer hires a particular type of people. Uh, so a, you know, perhaps a less fraught version of this sort of thing would be uh, if you go to a Victoria's Secret store, you will typically notice that most of the people working there are women, right? If women are going to a Victoria's Secret store to buy themselves lingerie, most of them would rather buy it from another woman. And so Victoria's Secret tends to mostly hire women as their sales representatives. Uh, so in this case, when we have some form of taste-based discrimination, uh, the employer is only going to hire these people uh, if they're coming along at a very cheap wage, right? They don't want to. They don't want to work with these people. They don't want to hire these people, and so they're simply either not going to do it at all, uh, or they're only going to be willing to do it if they can get away with paying them, you know, a, a bargain wage. And this is going to end up with wage discrimination, or uh, wage discrimination, and we will have a wage differential based on, you know, who the people are. Now, this, the way the, the wages could go down could actually happen in one of two different ways. It could be sort of like I described it here, where the employer is willing to hire these people, but only at a reduced wage. So you can imagine how that would lead to a wage differential, right? If, if you go to an, an employer and they say, well, what's your race? And I'll pay you differently based on your race. Well, obviously, that's going to lead to a wage differential. Uh, but it also could happen a different way. It could be that, you know, you simply can't get a job at all with certain employers, right? Certain employers are discriminating against you. And then the other employers, maybe even ones that have no taste-based discrimination within them, right? They don't care, but they realize, hey, you know what? This group of people, they're having trouble getting jobs. So even though I don't have any discrimination against them myself, I can probably afford to pay them less because they're having trouble finding jobs elsewhere. Whichever way it is, you end up with a wage differential and a wage discrimination as a result. Now, there is a weird kind of bright side to this in that if the labor market is competitive, this is a non-profitable thing to do. Uh, so if the, if the discrimination is coming from the employer or from other employees, uh, it is a money losing strategy. You can think about why this is. Well, you got a whole bunch of great people coming to you trying to get a job and you say, no, I'm not going to hire you because of this completely unrelated reason, right? So your, your competitors, they're going to hire all these great workers and they're going to compete the heck out of you and you're going to go out of business, right? So this particular form of discrimination uh, tends to sort of wash itself out of the market as long as there are at least some employers out there willing to hire whoever's being discriminated against. And in fact, this does bear out in the market. So here we have a graph. Uh, this is from a study. It's actually a follow-up study. Uh, so what this was is in 2004, uh, these researchers sent out, sent out a bunch of fake resumes. Okay, so they made up all these fake resumes with the exact same qualifications on the different resumes, right? So we're keeping the human capital, we're keeping the marginal product of labor exactly the same, okay? Uh, but what they, they, they did is that some of the resumes had names that sounded white, and the other resumes had names that sounded black. And they sent out these resumes, and they saw how many callbacks they got for the different resumes. And they did find that the white resumes tended to get more callbacks than the black resumes. But only at some of the businesses. Some of the businesses were engaging in this taste-based discrimination and others were not. Now, what the theory tells us is that the ones who were discriminating should be more likely to go out of business because the non-discriminating uh, employers are going to compete more effectively against them. And that is, in fact, exactly what we see. When, we did, when, when these researchers did a follow-up 10 years later, they found that of the firms that did not engage in discrimination, 17% uh, of them had gone out of business. However, of the firms that did show discriminatory behavior, 36% of them had gone out of business. Uh, so that the weird sort of silver lining here is that this is not a profitable behavior at the very least. Uh, so there is a little bit of karma at work, uh, hopefully. Now, uh, this silver lining, of course, has whatever the opposite of a silver lining is, uh, in that this won't deal with all sorts of discrimination, of course, right? We, this won't deal with consumer-based discrimination. Right? If the consumer wants to see you hire a particular sort of person, well, it's profitable to do what your consumers want, right? So if the reason that you're discriminating is not because of the employer or the other employees, it's because of the consumer, well, then that's not going to be unprofitable. That's not going to go away and sort of wash itself out in the long run. Additionally, uh, this theoretical assumption that it's going to wash out in the long run assumes that there's not really a lot of unemployment. If there's a lot of unemployment, that makes it no longer unprofitable to discriminate. Uh, imagine for a second that you are a discriminating employer and there's a lot of unemployment. 
Well, there's a lot, that means that when, when you go to hire somebody, there's a, all kinds of people who are equally qualified that you can pick from. And you can pick your preferred group without losing out on anything. So this result that we have that it washes itself out, it does seem to bear out, right? We had that, that resume study example, but it's not gonna work in every circumstance. So that's, that's too bad. Also, this is not gonna correct for any effects of past discrimination, right? If there was discrimination in the past that led certain groups of people to have, say, more higher levels of education and thus higher levels of human capital than others, well, it's gonna be profitable to go with the actual level of marginal productivity of labor that they actually have. All right, so that's taste-based discrimination. Let's talk also about statistical discrimination. So like I said before, statistical discrimination doesn't have anything to do with having a personal preference about a group of people. It's about making blanket assumptions or stereotypes about groups of people. The idea here, when you're hiring people, you're trying to guess how effective they're gonna be as workers, okay? Uh, so how are you gonna make that guess? Well, there's certain kinds of information that you have about them, right? You can read their CV or resume. Uh, you can talk to them and try to get a sense of what kind of person they have. And also you can observe what groups they belong to. And you might make some guesses about that person based on the groups that you observe. Uh, and that guess that you're gonna make is gonna be based on the blanket assumptions that you might make about that group of people, which is statistical discrimination. And this happens because you can't observe somebody's productivity perfectly. So let's take a quick example of this, a generic example. Let's say you're an employer uh, and uh, you have observed in the past that people from group X have a marginal productivity of labor of 10. Uh, and so somebody from group X comes to you and you think, well, how much am I willing to pay them? And you think, well, I'm gonna, I know that people like this person, people from this group have a marginal productivity of labor of 10. So I'm gonna assume that this person does too. And so I'm gonna pay them according to the marginal productivity of labor of 10. Now, I'm gonna do this whether they actually have a marginal productivity of labor of 10 or if they have a marginal productivity of labor of 20, right? They could be much more productive than I'm giving them credit for, but because I'm making this blanket assumption, I'm not paying them what they're worth. Now, this might sound familiar to you. If we think all the way back to the beginning of the lecture, this is exactly the red card, blue card game that we played, right? We had two groups of people that you could observe. You could observe that somebody had a red backed card or a blue backed card. Uh, and we can observe, uh, you know, what kind of wage these people got. And most of the time when I play this game in class, and probably if you're watching this video and thought about what you would do as an employer, uh, the people with the blue backed cards tended to get paid higher wages than the people with the red backed cards. Now, why might this be? Well, we can calculate out the expected utility, the expected value of hiring these workers, and we can find out that yes, in fact, the expected value of hiring somebody with a blue backed card is too higher than the expected value of hiring people with a red backed card. The profit maximizing thing to do is to pay the blue backed people two more than the red backed people. But think about what this means. You know, somebody with a number five on the front is gonna produce five for you, whether they have a blue back or a red back, right? So if you're a blue backed five, you're gonna get paid six, even though you don't really deserve it. And if you're a red backed five, you're gonna get paid four, even though you deserve better. Right? So this is statistical discrimination in action, right? When I play this game in class, people engage in statistical discrimination. And this happens because the employers can't actually see the number of productivity that they actually are. So they end up getting paid based on the blanket assumption that you might make based on the card color that you could see. So the strange thing about statistical discrimination is that when people hear about this for the first time, they tend to assume that, oh, well, it's based on statistics. It's based on, you know, these, these numbers that they have uh, for assumptions, they might actually be correct, right? It could be that they're correct. Uh, and in fact, it is profit maximizing. So the assumption is sort of, well, this is uh, more, this is not so bad. This is not as bad as the taste-based discrimination. But in fact, it's a little bit more odious in some ways. Uh, you know, that result that we had, that nice result, that taste-based discrimination, you know, is not a profitable thing to do. It tends to get booted out of the market. That's not the case with statistical discrimination. It tends to stick around because, well, if you're an employer, you want to maximize your profits, you want to use all the information that's available to you that you can. If those assumptions that you were making were in fact on average correct, it might be unfair, but it is profit maximizing. And so the statistical discrimination is not going to go away in the long run uh, like the taste-based discrimination should. Uh, and just because it's profitable doesn't make it any less unfair. Additionally, both of these kinds of discrimination feed into themselves, 
Remember how I said that uh, the taste-based discrimination might go away, but it's not going to correct for past discrimination? Well, that's the same thing with statistical discrimination. If you have a group that's discriminated against, they're going to end up with lower wages and less money, which means less money to invest in their kids, which means those kids are going to be able to inv invest less in human capital, which means that they're going to end up having lower levels of marginal productivity of labor, which is going to feed into the assumptions that people have about them in the next generation, and the whole cycle continues. It's a bit of a bummer, uh, but hopefully you already knew that. And yes, this stuff is still around. It does still happen. Uh, so we can talk. One of the cleanest ways to look at this are the resume studies, one of which I referenced earlier. This is by Bertrand and Melanathan, and they did it in 2004 in Boston and Chicago. They did the two different resumes. Again, the exact same uh, visible uh, uh, qualities, right? With the you know this exact same uh, college that they went to, the exact same uh, you know curricular extracurriculars, the exact same GPA. The only difference was the name, and there there were differences in the callback rates. Uh, another example of one of these studies uh, was by Phil Oriopoulos in 2011. And what he looked at was he, went, he was in Toronto and he was looking at immigrants. So he did the exact same idea, different kinds of resumes with the exact same qualifications. But one set had uh, immigrant sounding names, either names that sounded like they were Indian or Pakistani or Chinese or Greek, as opposed to non-immigrant sounding names, names that sounded like they were of uh, people who were born in Canada. Same sorts of things. The uh, immigrant sounding names got fewer callbacks than the non-immigrant sounding names, even if the qualifications were exactly the same. Okay, so let's sum it all up, right? We have gone over several different explanations of why different people get paid different amounts. We talked about human capital, which is sort of the fair version. People have different skills. That means there's different labor markets and some people are just more productive than others. So people get paid differently on that basis. Uh, we also talked about compensating differentials, certain jobs people really want to work in, so you don't got to pay them as much to do it. Some jobs people really don't want to work in, so you have to compensate them a whole lot to make up for the fact that they really don't want to be there. We also talked about labor unions. Labor unions are where people band together to negotiate for higher wages, uh, which means that, well, in a job where there's a labor union, you're going to get paid more than in a job without a labor union. We then talked about discrimination. We talked about taste-based discrimination, which is based on personal preferences against groups of people, which unsurprisingly leads to those groups of people having lower wages. Uh, so wage differential on the basis of who they are. We also talked about statistical discrimination, uh, which is where people get paid different amounts because of the blanket assumptions that people make uh, based on the qualities that they can observe about that person. Uh, it's sort of like signaling a little bit, which we talked about a couple lectures ago. All right. so. That sort of sums it all up. Uh, that is the end of all of our lectures. Uh, so uh, hope that you have enjoyed all of these. Uh, hope that you are ready as we go into the final midterm uh, and the final final. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and I hope that I will see you in some other class or on some other video. Thank you very much.